Uh, I have to give you a few little tidbits of information on this poem. Um, <clears throat> The, the author offhandedly man, man, uh, mentions a life of Alexander Selkirk. If we had time, I could probably give you 30 minutes of the biography of this man's life, who was born in 1676 in a small uh, coastal town of Scotland. Um, fascinating tale. In his youth, he displayed a quarrelsome and unruly disposition. At uh, age 17, he was summoned before authorities for his indecent conduct in church. And I've thought a time or two, I wonder what that was about, but then I stopped thinking about that. Anyway, home from, home from sea, uh, at now at age 25, he again came to the attention of the authorities for assaulting his brothers. Two years later, he decided to get into privateering and joined a small expedition to the South Pacific. Now, just quickly, and I won't carry this on too much, but I, this is such a fascinating tale. Privateers were privately owned ships who were armed and were commissioned by the crown to go out and harass the enemy or supply ships, and then the people on the ship got a percentage of the take. The queen or the, the, the monarch got half, and the ship had to settle with the rest. Um, it's interesting that uh, in those days, a sailing vessel could do a maximum of about 50 miles in a day. This, this boat left Scotland in September and was had to cross, go around the tip of South America, which just to get there at best speed would have taken 165 days, just to get there. So anyway, they get, they get over in the Pacific off the coast and uh, this, this is the key part to the, to the story that's coming. Uh, the, uh, the captain was stopping for water and supplies at an island 420 miles off the coast. Well, this guy Selkirk says to the captain, the ship is unworthy. We need to stop for major repairs. Well, he ticked off the captain so bad that the captain exiled him to the, uh, to the, to the island, gave him a musket, a hatchet, a knife, a cooking pot, a Bible, bedding, and some clothes. Uh, Curiously enough, Selkirk's prophecy came true. Some months later, the ship sank, and those that survived ended up in a very unpleasant prison in uh, Lima, Peru. Anyway, uh, Selkirk thrives on feral goats and fish and survives there for four years and four months till he's rescued, and it's a fascinating tale. Anyway, that was the thing. Okay. This poem starts out shot from guns. The, uh, it first mentions a ship uh, called the Bally Shannon. Caribou is an imaginary place, not a coffee shop. Uh, it has two actors, uh, Peter Gray and Summers. And the author sometimes mentions Peter or Gray, so try not to be confused. Um, one of the companies that uh, the company that Peter works for is Peter or Peter is Baker Croup and Co. The author has such a wag with names. Um, on the shingle is stones on a seashore, seashore worn smooth, uh, not part of the disparaging nickname soldiers of my day used to refer to cream chip beef on toast. Uh, most ridiculous, m most ridiculous, um, following the influence of Darwin in the 19th century when this was written, everybody was putting things in Latin names. So that's why. That. Soliloquizing, a um, form of soliloquy like Hamlet's famous speech to no one, to be or not to be. Ah, uh, two more. Charterhouse is the home office of a business granted trade and administrative powers by the British Crown to uh, operate in overseas uh, territory, and frigate is an armored vessel designed for speed. Etiquette. The Bally Shannon foundered off the coast of Caribou and down in fathoms many went the captain and the crew. Down went the owners, greedy men, whom hope of gain allured. Oh, dry the starting tear, for they were heavily insured. Besides the captain and the mate, the owners and the crew, the passengers were also drowned, 
excepting only two. Young Peter Gray, who tasted tea for Baker, Krupp, and Co., and Summers, who from eastern shores imported indigo. These passengers, by reason of their clinging to a mast upon a desert island, were eventually cast. They hunted for their meals as Alexander Selkirk used, but they couldn't chat together. They had not been introduced. For Peter Gray and Summers, too, though certainly in trade, were properly particular about the friends they made, and somehow thus they settled it without a word of mouth that Gray should take the northern half, while Summers took the south. On Peter's portions, oysters grew, a delicacy rare, but oysters were a delicacy Peter couldn't bear. On the summer side was turtle on the shingle, lying thick, which Summers couldn't eat because it always made him sick. Gray gnashed his teeth with envy as he saw a mighty store of turtle unmolested on his fellow creature's shore. The oysters at his feet aside, impatiently he shoved for turtle and his mother were the only things he loved. And Summers sighed in sorrow as he settled in the south, for the thought of Peter's oysters brought the water to his mouth. He longed to lay him down upon the shelly bed and stuff. He had often eaten oysters, but had never had enough. How they wished an introduction to each other they had had when on board the Bally Shannon and it drove them nearly mad to think how very friendly with each other they might get if it wasn't for the arbitrary rule of etiquette. One day while out a hunting for the must ridiculous, Gray overheard his fellow man soliloquizing thus, I wonder how the playmates of my youth are getting on. McConnell, S.B. Walters, Patty Vile, and Robinson. These simple words made Peter as delighted as could be. Old chummies at the charter house were Robinson and he. He walked straight up to Summers, then he turned extremely red, hesitated, hemmed and hawed a bit, then cleared and throat his said, <clears throat> I beg your pardon, pray forgive me if I seem too bold, but you have breathed the name I knew familiarly of old. You spoke aloud of Robinson. I happen to be by. You know him? Yes, extremely well. Allow me, so do I. It was enough. They felt they could more pleasantly get on for, ah, the magic of the fact. They each knew Robinson. And Mr. Summer's turtle was at Peter's service quite, and Mr. Summer's punished Peter's oyster beds all night. They soon became like brothers from community of wrongs. They wrote each other little odes and sang each other songs. They told each other anecdotes disparaging their wives. On several occasions, too, they saved each other's lives. They felt quite melancholy when they parted for the night and got up in the morning soon as ever it was night. Each other's pleasant company they reckoned so upon and all because it happened that they both knew Robinson. They lived for many years on that inhospitable shore and day by day they learned to like each other more and more. At last, to their astonishment on getting up one day, they saw a frigate anchored in the offing of the bay. To Peter, an idea occurred. Suppose we cross the main. So good an opportunity may not be found again. And Summers thought a minute, then emphatically said, Done! I wonder how my business in the city's getting on. But stay, said Mr. Peter. When in England, as you know, I earned a living tasting tea for Baker, Croup, and Co. I may be superseded. My employers think I'm dead. 
Then come with me, said Summers, and taste indigo instead. But all their plans were scattered in a moment when they found the vessel was a convict ship from Portland outward bound. When a boat came off to fetch them, though they felt it very kind, to go on board they firmly but respectfully declined. As both the happy settlers roared with laughter at the joke, they recognized a gentlemanly fellow pulling stroke. Twas Robinson, a convict in an unbecoming frock, condemned to seven years for misappropriating stock. They laughed no more, for Summers thought he had been rather rash in knowing one whose friend had misappropriated cash. And Peter thought a foolish tack he must have gone upon in making the acquaintance of a friend of Robinson. At first, they didn't quarrel very openly, I've heard. They nodded when they met and now and then exchanged a word. The word grew rare and rarer still, the nodding of the head, and when they greet each other now, they cut each other dead. To allocate the island, they agreed by word of mouth. And Peter takes the north again, and Summers takes the south. And Peter has the oysters, which he hates in layers thick. And summer has the turtle. Turtle always makes him sick. Etiquette, ladies and gentlemen. That's, uh, that's written by uh, William Gilbert, Sir William Gilbert of Gilbert and Sullivan, writing in the, and for about 10 years he wrote ballads like this and got paid pound a piece to have when they, whenever they were published. And I just think it's incomparable, really fun stuff. And uh, thank you for letting me do that. For those of you who think that's a preposterous story, I have a little tale of my own. Um, it takes place in Mobile, Alabama, a bunch of years ago when I was uh, in another life, not the uh, impecunious wastrel you see standing in front of you this evening, but... Uh, but I had some connections and I was in the uh, uh, Mobile Country Club for cocktails, not for golf. We were up on the second floor, over look, looking the green. I'm chatting with these people that I that was a briefly, or just casually acquainted with. Some other friends of theirs came in and say, so-and-so is downstairs having a party, come on down and say hi. So some of the people left, I said, I'll be right there. I've just got a word or two to say, well, I probably talked five minutes and didn't shut up like I always do. And finally, I went down to find the party. I didn't see any of my friends there. Apparently, they'd been and already gone. It turned out that it was a sweet 16 party for one of the uh, uppity-ups in the town of Mobile. So I'm waiting, thinking maybe the people are coming down. So I'm sitting there watching these uh, sweet 16 girls dance. And I wasn't having a bad time, and I wasn't in a particular hurry to leave. Anyway, out of the corner of my eye, I see this young fellow come up, and he's got a badge on his shoulder. He says, security. And he says, sir, uh, would you step outside, please? I said, I beg your pardon? He said, would you, uh, may I get you to talk to me outside? And I go out there, and he, he, I said, what's the trouble? And he said, uh, the, uh, the hostess doesn't know who you are. And I started to say, well, I'm so-and-so, and I'm friends with such-and-such, and da-da-da. -such, he said, sir, I'm sorry, you just can't be in the party. I had some curt comeback. It was civil, but I was... So I walk upstairs, and I talk to the people that I was, was with, and, and they said, where have you been? And I said, I just got kicked out of the downstairs party, and they thought this was riotously funny. And, and there was some exchange about this. <clears throat> and... Uh, the one, another, an older woman said, she says, well, you know what the problem was. She said, the woman, the hostess, who's a matron of the, of the city, didn't know who you were. And if she didn't know you, you weren't worth knowing. There will be a poem in this story, but I haven't gotten around to it yet. 